Merry January, everyone! Aside from Christmas, one really fun thing that happened to me this December, that, that, yeah, that's when Christmas happens, is that I read two novels that have joined my top echelon of best novels I've ever read. Legit. One of them I already did a video on talking about how it's now in my official top three books ever, and the other one was a Christmas present from my parents that I devoured across Christmas Day and Boxing Day, and oh my goodness gracious. So I'm going to talk about both of those, as well as the other ten-ish books that I read in December. Let's go. I'll start with the ones I don't have, because they're currently at my flat, and I'm at my girlfriend's flat right now. As I always am these days. <laughs> She likes me. For now. The first of those books was my final review of 2022, the last book that I formally reviewed, which was The Tatami Galaxy by Tomihiko Morimi, translated by Emily Balistrieri from the Japanese into English, and it was a really, really lovely Japanese novel. It is a Groundhog Day style thing that is split into four acts, which retells the same life of a university student in Kyoto. There's an anime of it, which I have not watched, and I think it's interesting that of the three books that we have available in English by Tomihiko Morimi, all three of them have some kind of anime adaptation. It's a really, really charming Groundhog Day style novel that repeats itself again and again and again, where we see the life of this boy through slightly different lenses. It's kind of like a butterfly effect, where you look at how tiny little changes, tiny little moments shape our lives. The people that we meet and the circumstances in which we meet those people really have an effect on our lives going forward. And those effects can be big and small, and if they're small, they still really matter. You can go watch my full review, but I had a lot of fun reading this novel. The other book that I don't have with me is now in my top three novels of all time, and that is If We Were Villains by M. L. Rio. Holy mother of God, this novel is perfection. It is tailor-made for me. It is a murder mystery, which I love. It is all about theatre students, specifically Shakespeare, and I love Shakespeare, and I was a theatre student. And it's a piece of dark academia, which is a genre that I have a love-hate relationship with, and I'm really glad that If We Were Villains came along to basically go, no, this genre is great. See? See what I've done here? And I went, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're the best book ever. Thanks. <laughs> if We Were Villains is very secret history-esque, but it very much treads its own path. I mean, you can see the blueprint of the secret history in this book, but I liked the secret history, and I, I really love If We Were Villains. It begins with a boy, or a man, who's now 31, 32 years old, and he's coming out of prison after spending 10 years doing time for second-degree murder, which he didn't do. And it was a friend of his. They were at university together, doing this special theatre course at an arts college. And then you flash back to these seven students as they are putting together Shakespeare plays in order to graduate. But at some point, we know one of them, and we don't know which one, is going to die. We know that our protagonist will eventually go away for the crime, and we also know that he didn't do it. So this is a murder mystery almost told in reverse. But it's also a dedication, a love letter to Shakespeare, and the ways in which the characters, the plots, and the themes of the Shakespeare plays that they put on bleed out into the lives of these people. As they put on Julius Caesar, they start acting like the characters in Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar happens to be my favourite Shakespeare play. So this really is my perfect book. I cannot say enough great things about If We Were Villains, so go watch my video in which I talk about how it's my new favourite book. Okay, now to the big stack of stuff that I actually have with me. And I'm glad I have this one with me because it's a children's picture book. And this is Me and My Dysphoria Monster by Laura Kate Dale. Laura Kate Dale is someone that I am a huge fan of, and I have to be careful not to fangirl over her right now. I have been listening to a podcast that she co-hosts for the best part of six years now, maybe more. I read her reviews, I watch her videos, she's great. And I've read other books that she's written. Laura Kate Dale is predominantly a video games critic. She's also a trans woman, and a lot of her books are about being trans. She wrote a memoir, 
about her coming out story, about her exploring the connection between the fact that she is autistic and also transgender, and she compiled a wonderful collection of essays about gender euphoria, which is a really, really lovely book. And now she's written this, Me and My Dysphoria Monster, which, as you can see, is an illustrated children's book. The illustrations were done by Ang Hui Ching, and I was lucky enough to meet both of these people about 10 days ago at the time of recording, just before Christmas. Meeting Laura was a pleasure, I've wanted to meet her in some capacity for a long time, and I got to chat with them about the book and how it came to be, and why she wanted to specifically write a children's book. Me and My Dysphoria Monster is about a young girl who is dealing with her gender dysphoria. She was born a boy, as a lot of us are. <laughs> as I was, and yet she knows that that is wrong. That is not who she is. And so this book explores her journey to self-discovery and self-acceptance, and her dysphoria, which is something that all trans people struggle with for the most part, I definitely do, manifests as a monster. And the monster grows depending on the situation that she's in, and it shrinks, and it's something that she needs to learn to tame and control. The illustrations by Ang Hui Ching are absolutely stunning. This is an incredibly lively, bubbly, curly and colourful collection of images that I really, really love. The monster's depiction as this sort of horrible black cloud, this amorphous thing that spreads like a disease that you can visually see in the air is pretty captivating, but because it's a kid's book, the monster is still kind of pretty to look at in its own way, and I think that sends an interesting message, the idea that dysphoria is simply something we have to tame. It's not something that is necessarily ugly, it's not necessarily something that's going to hurt us, it's something that we can learn to almost befriend and control and bring over to our side, turn this dysphoria into euphoria, and I think that that's a lovely message. Laura's done a great job writing this, and it's a fantastic little picture book for little kids. If you are a parent of a young transgender child who is, I don't know, what's the age, what's the age range for this? I'm not good with kids, what's the age range? Five? Five to eight. Five, thank you, honey. My partner's a primary school teacher, so... Five to eight. If you've got a kid who's five to eight, maybe nine or ten, I don't know, give them this. If they're struggling with their gender identity, if they think that they are transgender, give them this. Read this to them. Make it a bedtime story. It's lovely. Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. My latest video before this one was a video discussing how this should have been in my top 10 list of the year, but it wasn't because I made that list before I read this. This is a really, really great novel that, like If We Were Villains, is pretty tailor-made for me because it is a saga of friendship and personal growth set in the 90s about the video games industry. It's about two friends specifically, but there's also a third friend who's very important to the plot. But these two friends, a boy and a girl, grow up together, kind of, fall out, find each other again when they're both at university, and they start making video games together. She's at MIT, and she has made an incredible little indie game. He plays it, he wants to then make games with her, the two of them rekindle their old childhood friendship, and they start a video games development group together. And they do a really good job, and we watch them grow from budding students into self-reliant, successful games designers. And as someone who loves video games, who has a vested interest in the games industry, the good and the bad, I found this incredibly moving. And the games aside, as I said in my video, this could have been about two people who are part of a rock band, or two people who make a book together. They didn't have to be games designers. It's about two people creating art together. It's about two people growing together. They form a business together. They fall out. They have artistic disagreements. This is a saga of friendship, as I said. This is about two people growing together and creating art together. And I found it so moving. And obviously all the references to 90s video games is just a lot of fun, and it's handled really deftly as well. It's not cringe, it's not awkward. This is a very powerful novel that spans a lot of time, and you really, really fall for these people. Here's an interesting thing that I think I'll do a full video on pretty soon when I've read a few more. This is a magazine called Hellebore. 
I'm just going to read what it says on the back. Hellebore is a collection of writings and essays devoted to folk horror and the themes that inspire it. Folklore, myth, history, archaeology, psychogeography, and the occult. This is the very first issue. I actually picked this up when I was in Bath a few months ago, and I kept putting off reading it. And I eventually read it just before Christmas, and I'm now going to go on their website and order more issues. Look at this thing. It's absolutely brilliant. This article right here is about the history of witchcraft. And there's lots of stuff like this. The very first article is about sites of sacrifice. Different sites, specifically around the UK, that are dedicated to human sacrifice, like Stonehenge probably was. And these articles are written by people who have a vested interest in these topics, who maybe have PhDs or are currently getting their PhDs in these topics, maybe they've written books on these topics. So these are all experts in specific fields of folk horror. And these are true stories, historical... What's the word I'm looking for? Accounts. Accounts. If you like folk horror, if you like the occult, if you like the bleak history of things like witchcraft, get this magazine. It's really, really great, and I think it's a new obsession of mine. Next is this. I'm gonna do a video on this pretty soon when I've read another Greek mythology novel that I have on my TBR pile. I love books that retell stories of mythology. They are everywhere right now, and they are mostly really good. There are so many authors, almost all of them women, who are taking mythology, mostly Greek mythology, and retelling it from a feminist perspective. You've got authors like Madeline Miller, Natalie Haynes, Jennifer Saint, Nikita Gill, the poet, and Pat Barker, who is doing the best job of all of them, in my opinion. Pat Barker's books are always incredible. But anyway, I finally read Stone Blind. This is a novel that came out this year, and it's really, really impressive. Natalie Haynes wrote Thousand Ships and Pandora's Jar, both of which I absolutely loved, and you can find some of my writing about those books on our website. Stone Blind, as the title and the cover suggests, is a story that retells the life of Medusa. But if you've read Thousand Ships, and you know how disjointed that narrative is, and how Thousand Ships had a lot of different protagonists, a lot of different perspectives, and it jumped around willy-nilly, that happens here as well. This is not just Medusa's story, but it also kind of is, because every single narrative that you have here, every single perspective, leads us to Medusa. And that includes the story of Perseus, the man who ultimately killed her. So you've got the perspective of Medusa, the other Gorgons as well, her sisters, You've got Perseus, you've got Hermes and Athena. There's a big cast here, and you see through all of their eyes at different points. And seeing through Medusa's eyes, for obvious reasons, is particularly interesting. But like all of these Greek mythology books, this is a feminist retelling that explores the ways in which patriarchy abuses women. And it turns Medusa's story into a horrific tragedy. And I would say of all of these Greek mythology retellings, this is the one that emotionally hit me hardest. I don't think it's my favourite, I still think the ones that Pat Barker has written are my favourites, and everyone likes the Song of Achilles. But I did prefer this to Thousand Ships. I liked Thousand Ships, but I really loved this, because I was almost in tears, just trying to digest Medusa's story and the tragedy of it all. Here's an interesting book. I haven't finished it yet. This is Plain Bad Heroines. This is a really big book and people generally love it. This book is a pretty big deal. And I have been reading it in tiny little chunks. I'll read like 30 pages and then pick up a new book, and then read another 30 pages and then pick up another book. And I'm just slowly making my way through it. Everything that I've read, I enjoy, and yet for some reason I'm struggling to dedicate all my time to it. So I just read it in little chunks. It begins with a girl's school at the turn of the 20th century, and there are two young girls at this school who are secretly in love with each other, and they sneak off to a meadow on the school grounds, or outside the school grounds, to chat with each other and do some kissing and stuff. And then they get killed by yellow jacket wasps. 
It's really, really horrible. They are viciously killed by a group of yellow jackets. Then we fast forward to the present day and you've got two young actresses in Hollywood. They're in their 20s and they're breaking into Hollywood and they've both been cast in a film that tells the story of the legend of that school and those two girls that died and other people who ended up dying in the school shortly after because it's now kind of considered a cursed place. And that's it, that's pretty much all I know so far. I'm about a hundred-ish pages in, but it's, it's a decent sized book. I'm hoping to finish it soon. I just struggle to dedicate myself to it for some reason. I'll, I'll, I'll jump back in soon. Here's a book I DNF'd. It was all right. I mean, I read exactly half of it. It was fine. This is How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackie. I took it home to read at Christmas because I thought it would be funny to sit in the living room with my parents and have this book next to me. And uh, it, was, it was about as funny as you'd expect. It was like a three out of 10 joke. Anyway, this is fine. It's basically the film Promising Young Woman, but with fewer teeth. I liked Promising Young Woman a lot. I hated the ending, and I could do a whole video essay on why I hate the ending of that film. But this book is very similar to that film without as much oomph, without as much gusto. It's about a young woman who was born in relative poverty to a French mother in London, and her father is a very, 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 very rich man who knocked her mother up and then wanted nothing to do with either of them and that led to a pretty sad life. And so, now that her mother is dead, and her father is dead, she has decided to kill the rest of her father's side of the family. So, the novel begins with her going to Spain to kill her father's parents, and then she proceeds to kill more and more of the members of her father's side. So it's a novel about class imbalance and the unfair treatment of poorer people by richer people in a very intimate way. And while this, in a lot of ways, is a book that I should love because it's a kind of murder mystery and it's about class inequality, I found it only okay. And I got about halfway through and then suddenly it was Christmas Day and I had a brand new book to read that turned out to be the best thing ever, which I'll talk about now. That book was this, Little by Edward Carey. I've been meaning to read Edward Carey for ages, and so I asked my parents for this as a Christmas present because this is a new, beautiful, hardback edition of Little. It came out in paperback and now they've brought this out and it's stunning, so I thought, right, I'm gonna get this and then I'm gonna actually read Little, and it is amazing. It is a novelization of the life of the woman who would eventually become Madame Tussaud, the woman who created all the wax works. Oh my God. So I don't cry that often at books. I am emotionally affected by books an awful lot, but I don't often sob. And on Boxing Day, I got about 90% through this book. I was getting right towards the end and something happened that made me absolutely sob. I was weeping. And then my mum came in and brought me a sandwich. But oh my God, this is the first time in like 10 years that I have absolutely sobbed my eyes out at a novel. This is a beautiful, gothic-ish, creepy-ish novel about the entire life of this woman from her birth all the way through to stuff that happens I'm not gonna talk about, but it kind of goes up until her middle age. Oh my good golly gosh. You've got traversal through multiple countries, you've got her apprenticeship with this strange man, you've got mistreatment by people, you've got the fact that she's probably bisexual and a lot of cool stuff happens with that, and you've got the French Revolution playing a part in this as well. This is epic. Absolutely incredible. Edward Carey is a genius writer. And that led me to read this, The Swallowed Man by Edward Carey. This was my final read of the year and is a retelling of Pinocchio from the perspective of Geppetto in the belly of the beast. That's all I really need to tell you. That's what this is. Geppetto is stuck in the belly of the big fish that ate him and he retells his story about creating Pinocchio and now being stuck in a big fucking fish. It's really good and it's a lot shorter, it's like 150 pages and I'm gonna do a full video on both of these very soon. So I don't wanna tell you any more because I want time to really think about both of these novels and talk about them in a video about how great Edward Carey is. For Christmas, I read The Hogfather. I put up a video on Christmas Day about this and uh, the video did pretty well considering the fact that it was Christmas Day. But if you haven't watched it, go watch it. 
go check out my thoughts on Hogfather. It is a Terry Pratchett novel set in his beloved Discworld, which is a satirical fantasy world. Ha! Oh, this is lovely. This tells the story of a group of people who managed to kind of kill the Discworld version of Father Christmas, or Santa Claus, and Death, the Grim Reaper, one of the great protagonists of the Discworld, steps in to replace the Hogfather and try to do Christmas and make sure that Christmas, or Hog's Watch, actually happens. It's really, really lovely. There's also a really good TV adaptation in two parts that I also watched while reading this, and I hugely recommend that too. Finally, I also read this. This is an Agatha Christie novel. I almost always read an Agatha Christie novel around Christmas time, and this is Five Little Pigs. This is honestly now one of my favorite Agatha Christie novels. I was so enamored with the story of this book. It begins with a young girl who calls up Hercule Poirot and says, so I'm 21, and when I was about five years old, my mum supposedly killed my dad. And I don't think she did. In fact, I know she didn't, because now that I'm 21, I've been given access to this letter from my mum saying she didn't do it. Even though, when the crime happened, she happily went to jail, went to trial, and just was like, yeah, sure, okay, I did it, and then died in prison. And yet, for some reason, the only person she confessed the fact that she didn't do it to is her daughter. So her daughter has now called Poirot and said, can you dig up a 16-year-old mystery, a cold case that's not really cold because she did it, and then find out who actually did it and clear her name, and also figure out why she confessed to it if she didn't do it. And I guessed everything. <laughs> I don't always try and do this, with uh, Agatha Christie books, I tried to just enjoy the story, but this is the second time I've read a Christie book where I guessed exactly what happened. I guessed the reason why she went to jail for the crime she didn't commit, and I guessed who really did it. So this and Crooked House are the two books that I've managed to figure out about halfway through, and I was so proud of myself. It's really good though, really, really good. Okay, that's everything I read in December. Merry New Year, and uh, I got a lot of cool stuff happening in the first half of this year. A lot of cool stuff. So look forward to some great videos. My next video is gonna be an important one. So, you know, keep a weather eye open. Subscribe for books.